it is so good to be together with you in the presence of the Lord today. Amen? So nice to gather together. All right. Well, we are in the middle of a series entitled Exile, in which we are looking at the Babylonian captivity of the Israelites who were exiled in Babylon from their home in Jerusalem. And we are looking at it through the lens of some major prophets we find in the Bible, right? We have heard from Jeremiah, we're gonna hear from Daniel and Nehemiah a little bit later, but today we are going to continue on and looking at Ezekiel. Drew started us last week looking at Ezekiel's prophecy of giving us a new heart. And as if having the imagery of God's spirit taking out your heart and giving you a new one isn't graphic enough for you because it's Halloween season, right? It's about to get a little more spooky today uh, because we are going to be transported into the Valley of the Dry Bones. And we're going to look into a prophetic dream that God gave Ezekiel that reveals God's plan to restore the Israelites, making them partners with God. So mark your Bibles for Ezekiel 37, um, because that's where we are going to end up today. But first, turn to Genesis 2, because we're going to spend some time there. Um, Before we go any further, would you guys pray with me? Father, thank you for this opportunity to be together. I pray that the meditations of our hearts this morning and the words of my mouth are pleasing to you. Spirit, be near, because we need you. Amen. All right, so we are going to start in the very beginning, Genesis 2, and we're going to recount the Eden story because it will give us actually great insight into Ezekiel's encounter with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Genesis 2, starting in verse 4. In the days that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Am I moving too much, Connor? I feel like I am keep getting like... Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So bear with me. Okay. Dry ground, right? No water, no humans, no plants, right? God supplies this water in the form of a spring that just kind of comes from within the earth. Right? It rises up and it leaks out. And I want you to keep that imagery with you as we continue on. Okay? Let's keep going. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. We're going to stop there again. Because there on the ground, right, where the earth was dust, there was nothing there. And water, a water stream emerged right there. What did it say? God formed the human species from the dust, out of mud, Adam, which means the human species. The human body was formed right then in one sentence. Okay, we're going to keep going. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. You see, God needed to breathe his, do you guys remember this word for breath or spirit? His ruach needed to breathe his ruach into the skeletal bone, form of bones that were made out of dirt and water in order to make it a living creature. Heaven, his breath, coming to earth. Tim Mackey explains this beautifully. Um, I love this quote when he says, humans are a place where something transcends the material order, but is also fully enmeshed in emerging out of and woven into the material order. Earth and heaven, the human creature. Isn't that beautiful? Now for an illustration that I'm going to make a little bit later, we are going to reference this living being creature, okay, this human being, as human life 1.0. 
okay? Body is made from earth. Heaven is breathed into this human, and it's just walking around, participating in the world around, okay? Now, we're going to go back to the Eden story. We're going to keep reading. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're going to jump down to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the days that you eat of it, you shall, what? Die. Die. Okay, so track with me. Humans were made, God placed them in this garden called Eden to till it and to keep it. And we learned that there were three different types of trees. I'm sure there were many more, but they mentioned three in scripture, right? For very specific purposes in this garden. One, the first tree um, was made for two purposes. It was pleasant to look at and it was to eat for nourishment, right? The second was a tree of life. Now this tree of life was a real tree. It was actually planted right where that stream came up from the ground. Isn't that fascinating? And it symbolized God's presence and source of eternal life. It was in the center of the garden and it was easily accessible to Adam and Eve at any point. They could live with God's presence at all times. They did live with God's presence at all times. They had access to God. They had access to eternal life. And they were invited. They were placed in the garden to participate with God's eternal kingdom right there in the garden. Now, this tree is interesting because if you're like me, aren't they already alive? (laughs) This tree of life. But the humans are already alive. Bones joined together, breath in their lungs, walking around alive, right? And this tree of life poses a question. Is there more life to be had? Now, for us peeking into this account, we can answer that question and say that Adam and Eve, yes, we're participating in God's eternal kingdom. And that is a different kind of life, right? Yeah. They were more than just a bag of bones walking around with breath in their lungs. They were humans who had access to God. Now this kind of life, for this illustration, we're going to call human life 2.0. Okay? All right. So the last tree, that's the second tree. The last tree that was in the garden was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it was commanded of Adam and Eve not to eat of this tree. Because if they did, they would die. Well, as we know it, they eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but did they die? Well, no, they didn't like fall to the ground, right? Later on in the story in Genesis 3, we read, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a sword flaming, turning to guard the way to the tree of life. See, Adam and Eve did not die a death that returned their bodies to dust of the ground, but they did experience something that they weren't created for, a level of brokenness. They were driven out of the garden, away from God's presence, or as some people call it, exile. Now, I have a picture that illustrates this, everything that I just said. If it helps you understand it a little bit better, this is, got it? Okay, so on the left there, there's the alive human 1.0, right? Walking about. Um, And then as we go, we see the stream coming up from, from the earth, And then we see the Garden of Eden right there. We have Human Life 2.0. That's where you commune with God and have access to God, right? And then as we move to the right of the picture, we see our brokenness, right? Or death, separation from God. And just as there is Life 1.0 and 2.0, there is also Death 
1.0 and 2.0. 1.0 being that your body returns to dust. And death 2.0 being the separation from God. And that's the ultimate death. Are you guys tracking with me? Okay. Hang with me. Because this picture is no different than the story of the Israelites that we are reading about right now in exile. Okay? We have the next one. Picture again. Okay? God spoke to Abraham, took him out of the land of Ur, right? Which, fun side note, um, Ur was actually in Babylon. Isn't that interesting? So God called Abraham out of Babylon, and he promised, God promised Abraham a couple of different things. I want you to remember them with me. He promised him descendants, right? A son, a blessing, a covenant, and God promised land. Now it took God's people a long time of going through the wilderness, but eventually they ended up in the promised land of Canaan, right? Where it is, you can read in scripture, it wells of fresh water and streams and rivers just pop up. They were everywhere. And it was good, right? God tells his people essentially just follow the terms of the, of the covenant Ah, and this place is going to be just like Eden. God's presence will be there among them. It was, he was among them, right? They participated in God's eternal plan. Does it end there though? No, it doesn't end up that way. They don't keep up their terms of the covenant. Covenant. They were warned over and over again by the prophets. And they too ended up right back where Abraham came from. Babylon. <clears throat> they were exiled, separated from God. Which brings us right up to the point where we are at in scripture now. God's people driven out in exile, feeling separated from God. Now, the analogy of these two stories of God's people are what generates all of the imagery for what we are going to read in Ezekiel 37, okay? So keep this in mind when we read this. Now, you can turn to Ezekiel 37, because I'm finally going to get to that scripture. We're going to read Ezekiel's prophetic dream that God gave him for the Israelite people. I'm going to read it all. So close your eyes and imagine it. Read along, whatever you need to do to listen best. Here it is. The hand of the Lord came upon me and he brought me out by the Ruach of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley and they were very dry. Interpretation, they were very dead. (laughs) No life. He said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath. I will cause ruach to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews, which are ligaments and tendons. I will lay sinews on you and I will cause flesh to come upon you and cover with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am Lord. So I prophesied and suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone like a magnet. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied and he command, as he commanded me and the breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. 
Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Now, there are two things that I want to unpack in this text. And listen, I could stand here all day. Like, I could go on and on of all of the interesting words and analogies and all the different scripture that could be brought in here. But I know that you guys want to go. So I only have two that I want to talk about today, okay? Okay. Uh, the first one is this. The bones in this dream represented the Israelites in exile, right? They were politically, economically, and religiously dry. They felt like they were in a hopeless and irreparable condition. Were they dead, though? No, right? They were walking around in Babylon eating, talking, existing. One might say human life 1.0. So when the Lord asks Ezekiel to prophesy that the Lord is going to open up their graves and bring them out, he isn't talking about opening the ground, the dirt, and resurrecting life 1.0. He is promising that he will bring them out of exile in this statement. But more than that, he is talking about delivering them from their covenantial death. Death 2.0. The you're cut off from the source of life type of grave. So when the Lord says, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your grave, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. He's essentially saying, watch this. I'm going to rescue you. I will give you a new heart, a restorative life, life 2.0. You will no longer be cut off from the source of life, but instead you will participate in God's eternal kingdom. You will no longer be looking to a tree or to possessed land, or a temple, or rituals, or sacrifices, feelings, checked boxes, the four walls of a build, building, because you will have life and life abundantly instead through the very source of life who's going to live in you. See, even in exile, God offers life. God always offers restorative life. Which means that we can take an honest inventory of ourselves today and ask, am I feeling like the Israelites were in exile? Politically, economically, or religiously dry? Do I feel like my current state is hopelessness? Is my state irreparable? You guys remember on that little picture I showed earlier in the Eden story? Right? The little arrows <laughs> on the right hand side, the ones that go back and forth from exile to human life, living life with God, right? Maybe you identify with those arrows. <laughs> Walking in unity with God and participating in his eternal kingdom and then falling short only to find yourself feeling separated from God. He's not really separated from you, he's there, right? But you feel like it. God wants to remind you that he has never left and is ready to offer restorative life to you. Come back to him, the giver of life. If I may borrow the words of Paul when he was encouraging the church in Ephesus, he says this, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead 
through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Friends, today there is hope. God always offers you life through having faith in his son, Jesus Christ, who came to pay the ultimate price of death so that you may have life, 2.0. And when you accept this gift of life through Jesus, his spirit has already been poured out and it is promised to live inside of you. Real quick, do you remember what God promises in Ezekiel right after he says, I will put my spirit in you and you will live? I'll tell you. The promise is this, and I will place you on your own soil. Now, real quick here, I'm just going to nerd out for a little bit because it's so fascinating, but the Hebrew verb for placed you that was used right here is the exact same verb that was used in Genesis when God places him in the garden. And the verb simply means to rest, to be whole. I will give life, I will give my spirit, I will make you whole and give you rest. Pretty amazing, huh? Now the second thing I wanna pause for in the story and worship team, you guys can come on up so that you make me finish on time. <laughs> um, this is, this is interesting, but isn't it interesting that God used Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones and the breath? In the Eden story, God is the one who built the bones and breathed, the, bre- breathed, and <laughs> he gave the breath, right? He put life into Adam. But after the initial creation of this world, think about this with me, the pattern that we see in scripture is that God typically chooses a human partner to carry out what he wants to have happen in the world. I'm not saying that he couldn't do it on his own because he definitely could. I'm saying he typically chooses or maybe even requires on some account, Jonah, (laughs) a human partner to carry it out. So when God asks Ezekiel to prophesy for the bones to come together and for breath to fill the lungs, Ezekiel listens. He follows through and then the Lord acts in conjunction with Ezekiel to bring life to the bones. God would be the one doing the regeneration, but why do you think God included Ezekiel? Why would Ezekiel be the one prophesying to the bones, to the Israelites? Why wouldn't God just tell them on his own? Because that is what he was created for, Ezekiel. Friends, it's what we were created for. We live in a world today where self-dependency and reliance and sufficiency is the goal. Live as autonomously as you possibly can. And may I be a little bold today and say the church might be one of the worst offenders of this. We come and sit in the same building together for an hour once a week, but only are open to receiving a word from the Lord for ourselves. Contending for something that that you need, I need, and only allowing the Spirit to move on my behalf. Do you guys remember the story of the Samaritan woman who went to the well in John 4? Right? Right? She's going to the well saying, I need something, Lord, I need, this is what I need. I need water, I'm going, I'm gonna get water from this well. And Jesus shows up and he says, water? Here's me, here's some living water, I'm right here. He 
He's in the business of offering the exact and only thing we need, which is Himself. And it often comes in that quiet, still, small voice of the wind, of His presence through His Word at church or at home. But so often, He pours that living water through His vessels, you and me, into the very dry spaces that are empty enough to be filled in each other. The woman at the well after encountering Jesus that day went back to the town, encouraging anyone and everyone who would listen that she met the Messiah that day. She met the giver of life. On that day, God used her to offer the living water of himself to anyone that listened to her, just like God used Ezekiel to share with the Israelites. God partners with people to bring people to himself. God is the only one who brings the breath and the miracle of restorative life to an individual. But be encouraged or reminded today that God typically chooses a human partner to carry out what he wants to have happen in the world. He requires your participation. So let him build your body back. Let's keep our eyes open our hearts soft and respond to his spirit's leading for yourself, of course, but also for others so that others may come to know the Lord and have an eternal and covenant life with him as well. Amen. Would you guys stand and pray before we worship? Lord, we need you today. We feel dry, maybe some of us hopeless, but we don't wanna do our life our way anymore. It's a living life. We don't wanna live life cut off from the source of life. We don't wanna live life cut off from you. So Spirit, come and convict us of places in our lives that we have shut off or shut out your restorative life to. Father, we're so sorry that we think that we can do it on our own. We turn back to you now. And even though we don't deserve it, we thank you for the gift of eternal and abundant life that you have given us through your son, Jesus. May our dependency and reliance and sufficiencies be anchored to you, the one who directs our steps individually here at Living Word as your body and globally, Father. Would you meet us again? We need you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever.